Welcome to ICN Sunday Morning. I'm Vernon Loeb, Executive Editor. Methane is a climate super pollutant, 86 times more potent at warming the environment than carbon dioxide over 20 years. Some of it comes from natural sources like wetlands, but 60% of methane emissions are man-made. They come from agriculture, they come from landfills, and they come from fossil fuel production. Methane is, in fact, the primary component of natural gas, and methane leaks from every step on the drilling and fracking chain, from the wellhead to the pipelines to the LNG terminals to the LNG transport ships themselves. So methane is an enormous climate problem. 40% of recent warming has come from methane. But because methane is a short-lived climate pollutant, staying in the atmosphere for an average of only about 12 years compared to carbon dioxide, which stays there for centuries, cutting methane can bring about a quicker response on slowing global temperature rise. And this is extremely important in the short term. Joining me this morning to talk about methane are two of our staff writers, Martha Piskowski, who's based in Texas, and Liza Gross, who lives outside Berkeley, California. Martha, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Vernon. Looking yeah. forward to talking. Yeah, and Liza, uh, great to have you on again. Great to be here. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Martha, let me start with you. So you just had a terrific piece in this week, uh, a partnership with ProPublica, where you uncovered some pretty massive uh, methane emissions from the Texas oil fields. Um, Tr President Trump has a new line. He likes to he likes to argue that America's oil industry is cleaner than everyone else's oil industry, and he he mounts this argument to promote our oil exports and our gas exports. Um, is there anything to this claim, Martha, from your reporting that our oil and our oil industry is cleaner than everybody else's? Well, if you look at, you know, the top countries that have the most flaring, the U.S. is up there, which isn't surprising because we're the biggest oil producing country at this point. Um, places like Russia, they have an even worse problem. Um, but there's plenty of other places doing better than us. Um, Norway has brought flaring down really low. So there's clearly a lot of room for improvement um, in this area. And... Uh, the targets that even multinational oil companies like Shell and Exxon have set, the U.S. isn't reaching those. So we can we can do better. Yeah. And, and tell us what flaring is. So flaring happens uh, mostly at oil wells because the company is drilling for the oil, but gas comes up along with it. And if there isn't a pipeline to take that gas away, the company ends up burning it, which is flaring it or venting it, which is just directly releasing it into the atmosphere. Um, so that's what we're talking about with flaring. Yeah. And so your reporting found that the Texas Railroad Commission, which is the regulatory agency in Texas for the oil and gas industry, pretty much approves every request for flaring natural gas and also venting natural gas, which is just releasing it into the environment. The commission pretty much approves every uh, permit request issued by the oil industry, correct? Right, we looked at a three year period and they approved 99.6%. So <laughs> very few requests got rejected. Yeah, and what is the Trump administration doing at this point to curtail methane leaks or or not? Well, the Trump administration, the EPA, currently they're focused on deregulatory action. So they've slowed down or canceled some of the, the regulations that the Biden administration had um, put in place to address methane emissions. So for example, there was going to be a fee um, so, you know, if your company is flaring, you're going to have to pay for the amount of gas that you flared, which clearly would have created a big incentive to address this. Um, so that fee is no longer going forward. So, you know, the Trump administration is really putting the brakes on a lot of the efforts to 
reduce flaring and methane emissions. Yeah, yeah. Liza, um, you've written a lot about the oil industry in California as well. California used to be a bigger oil state. I think it's seventh now uh, among oil producing states. Texas being num number one by far in, in production of both gas and oil. But um, you know a lot about the oil industry in California. But your piece, uh, I think it was about a week ago, which I found incredibly revelatory, came at the issue of methane from a human health standpoint. Um, methane um, has kind of been seen as um, not a health risk. Uh, but your uh, your piece said that isn't true. Ex explain explain that to to uh, our viewers, please. Yes, that's right. So for a long time, natural gas was viewed as a cleaner bridge fuel from dirtier fuels like coal and oil, and even calling it natural gas was uh, instead of fossil gas. I think contributed to the idea that it was cleaner. And I think as part of that narrative was the notion that natural gas is like only methane and there's nothing else in there. But over the last few years, scientists have recognized um, that people living near oil and gas wells suffer a lot of the same serious health effects from like nosebleeds, severe fatigue, aggravated asthma, even cancer. And so methane poses a safety risk because it, at, ex, at high enough levels, it can, be explo it can be an explosion risk. It can also suffocate you at high enough levels because it displaces oxygen. But you know, generally, it's considered non-toxic. So scientists at PSC Healthy Energy have been wondering, well, if people are getting sick you know, near, living near these operations, what else is leaking into the air with methane? And to find out, they did this kind of amazing um, intensive work where they collected gas samples near oil and gas um, operations across the country. They scoured regulatory findings to see what oil company, oil and gas companies disclosed were in the um, gas. And that allowed them to identify several toxic chemicals in the gas samples. And then using models, they estimated how much of these toxic chemicals were associated with methane emissions um, and actually charted, plotted the path of these toxic emissions along with the methane. And that, that allowed them to create what they call this um, methane risk map, which sort of makes these invisible plumes visible. Yeah, so, so let me get this straight. Um, essentially what they found was methane is sort of, um, I think one of your uh, sources called it a chemical soup. Where there's methane, there's also benzene, which is a carcinogen, and, and what else? What else is there, um, you know, when there's methane there? Yes. So um, that was Seth Shankoff of PSE Healthy Energy. He said natural gas is not just methane. It's actually closer to a chemical soup. And what they found was that there's this suite of toxic chemicals, um, including hexane and then this group of compounds called BTEX, which stands for benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene. They found those chemicals in every gas sample they analyzed. And so these are volatile gases that are naturally associated with benzene, but they come out of the, the ground with, with the hydro, hydrocarbons when they're extracted. So um, they're all classified by the EPA as hazardous air pollutants. One, as you said, benzene is a carcinogen, which means it's unsafe at any level. And the map shows that these methane super emitter events pose serious risk to air quality and human health, affecting thousands of people for miles around an event, which is particularly problematic in California and Colorado because a lot of these operations are right in people's backyards. I've seen them next to playgrounds, next to hospitals and nursing homes. So, you know, where people live, work and play is the way um, activists often talk about it. But what that means is it's exposing our most vulnerable populations to these chemicals. And it's this methane risk map really provides the evidence to show what people living near near these places, near, near these facilities have known all along that, you know, methane isn't just a climate super, you know, pollutant. It's not just fueling the climate crisis. It's also sort of fueling a public health crisis. And, and this is the case for people who live uh, wherever um, gas and oil are being extracted 
California, Pennsylvania, Texas, Colorado, um, New Mexico, Wyoming, and so on. Absolutely. And the, the next step for this group, this particular group, is to look at methane emissions near landfills and agricultural operations like concentrated animal feeding operations because they're also big sources of methane. Yeah, yeah. Um, all of this gets pretty, pretty distressing pretty quickly. Um, Martha, um, I like to end on a positive note if I can. So tell me something hopeful that you have found from your reporting in the Permian Basin in Texas. I say that reporting in Texas, I've just met the most amazing characters and, you know, the industry is obviously very influential here. So anyone who goes up against oil and gas, they've got to have a lot of guts to do that. So um, just, you know, these ranchers and, and different activists who despite all the odds being stacked against them or speaking up about this, um, definitely take a lot of hope from that, um, that, you know, change is possible. Yeah, the environmental movement is alive and well in Texas. Yes. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, and Liza, I suppose just this better understanding of, um, you know, what's there in the chemical soup with Methane is a step forward. Certainly, PSG Healthy. What What's the name of that nonprofit you're working? It's It's PSE Healthy Energy for physicians, uh, scientists, and engineers. Yeah. So there there's certainly um, um, there there's some good news there in their existence and their work. No. I think that's right. Uh, Seth, who's the executive, Sean Koff, the executive director of that group, um, called it a game changer. And the reason having this risk map, a game changer, and the reason he said that is because it sort of gives communities and policymakers and regulators the tools to estimate, you know, what the health risks and air quality impacts are going to be of these super emitter events. And that means that they can take steps to uh, reduce those risks. And I guess the other thing I would say is that as we've been talking about Trump rolling, the Trump administration rolling back regulations, having this tool will allow local and regional governments to, to sort of fill in the gap where our federal regulators are looking the other way. Yeah, well, that's certainly really good news. Um, Liza and Martha, thanks so much for being here. And thanks to all of you for uh, watching this morning, for reading our work, and for supporting us at Inside Climate News.